All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Unit 4 Guided Lecture. You can see this is Scientific, Philosophical, and Political Developments. And our time period is mid-17th century up until really the end of the 18th century. It says 1815, but we're really going to end with right around 1800. Four topics that we're going to be covering, Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, Enlightened absolutism, which the College Board separates a little bit from enlightenment, but they're, of course, closely related. And then we'll be ending with a, a brief look at 18th century European society and culture. The big two focus areas for this unit are the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, which I'm hoping you got a decent dose of your ninth grade year, and maybe you, you remember some of that. But also living in the country of the United States, a lot of this stuff is baked into our society, our culture, our politics. And so also I'm hoping that that's going to just support your understanding of these, these two really, really big developments. Um, so I titled this first slide the paradigm shift because what we're seeing here is a continuation of this paradigm shift that we really started the course with. The Renaissance and the Reformation, which are early to mid 16th century, open up this avenue for people to question old ideas. Of course, with the Renaissance and Reformation, it's primarily questioning religion, obviously the Reformation, but the Renaissance as well. The Renaissance is about looking at humans separately from God. This is humanism as an example there. So when we look at the Renaissance and Reformation, people are starting to question old ideas. And the key there is start. We're going to talk about a lot of, we, we, I'll take a step back. We talk about a lot of these developments in the historical field as if they are revolutions, but in reality, they're evolutions. They are movements or just developments that occur because of what came before. So the Renaissance and the Reformation are inextricably linked. They cannot be separated. The scientific revolution called a revolution, but it's really evolutionary based on the questioning that is begun during the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Enlightenment fits into that as well. So if the church can't be trusted, notice capital C, we're talking about the Catholic Church, although broadly we're talking about Christianity. The question that both the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment are going to be engaging with is how then should should people go about the uh, the the collection of knowledge, the dissemination of knowledge, really how should we as human beings understand the world around us? Because for a long time, millennia, the answer to that question was religion. You know, it, the, the church's teachings in Europe, that was how we understood the world around us. We start to see the answer changing when we're looking at the 16th century and certainly into the 17th century, the answer is shifting to rational thought and observation. If we can't trust what the priests are telling us, what the Pope is telling us, even if we can't trust what God is telling us, although that's a pretty radical idea, we should be trusting what we can view and what we can see. Rational thought and observation is going to begin, notice the word, begin to replace the idea of the church's teachings. This is another process that's going to take hundreds of years, um, but uh, it, it really, really takes hold when we get to the 17th century. So trust what you can see and what you know, what you know, not what you're told, but what you observe and therefore what you know. And so the result of this is the scientific revolution and the age of enlightenment. There are dates ascribed to both of these things, but I, I, am, I, really, I really strongly recommend that you take these as guidelines. I mean, these dates are, this is not like 1543 people woke up in Europe and were like, oh man, the revolution is on. It's that historians use these dates just so we can, we can put these developments into, into periods. Why 1543? Well, Nicholas, Comper, uh, Nicholas Copernicus publishes on the revolution of the heaven, heavenly spheres in that he theorizes that um, the earth is in fact not the center of the universe. What you're seeing here uh, in, the, in the picture is the Ptolemaic version of the universe. We'll talk about Ptolemy in a moment. This is the old ancient Greek version of the universe and Copernicus is going to challenge that. Of course, he's going to be somewhat right. I mean, he, he 
argues that the earth revolves around the sun, which is correct, but he also argues that the sun is the center of the universe, which isn't. But he gets us as a, um, as a scientific community closer to an understanding of the natural world that is correct. Why 1687 for the end, Isaac Newton publishes his principles on mathematics, which is in some ways the last great work of this time period. He basically creates modern physics with that work. And um, there, there's really not gonna be anything I don't want to say that the scientists will have my head, but it's not really until Einstein comes along in the early 20th century that we're going to have a huge sea change or a huge addition to what Isaac Newton is putting forward in those principles. So Ptolemy. Ptolemy is um, uh, an ancient Greek mathematician, uh, um, astronomer, philosopher, all those, those things, living in Egypt, but he is of Greek descent, um, and he's living in the second century. And Ptolemy is the one who really argues for the geocentric universe, that the earth is the center of the universe. Now, the church, the Catholic church really liked this because it means that if earth is the center of the universe, the philosophical underpinnings of that are that humans are special, that our place by decree of God, since he put earth at the center of the universe, is at the center of everything. And that means that humans are the greatest creations that God has ever made. Um, the Ptolemaic universe is, it, we can't really separate it out from religion because Ptolemy is theorizing this um, himself as a Christian. And so that we have, to, we have to remember that when we're thinking about Ptolemy and the Ptolemaic universe. This is not really gonna be challenged in a meaningful way until we get to the 16th century. There are steps along the way. There are definitely Islamic astronomers who are beginning to question this when we look at the Islamic scientific revolution in um, the uh, 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, really centered on Baghdad. For, for that time period, Baghdad was basically the center of the intellectual world. And so Copernicus is gonna be standing on the shoulders of a lot of those Islamic and uh, th those Muslim scientists. Um, but it's on the revolution of the heavenly spheres that is really going to shatter this belief in the Ptolemaic universe in the European world, all right? Other, other key developments here, the scientific method, which you are all aware of and um, intimately, <laughs> intimately aware of, because this is how we go about science now in, um, in, in, uh, in the Western world. So by observing and experimenting, humans could learn about the world around them. Um, like weather, the planets, for example. This is a shift from the Greek method of conclusions based on assumptions. So now what does this mean? Um, I found this quote when I was putting together the PowerPoint. Um, I think I found it on Wikipedia. It's a pretty good quote. Um, so I just ripped it off uh, like, <laughs> like what all good teachers do. Um, but I think this really summarizes the shift quite well. The philosophy of using an induction approach to obtain knowledge, to abandon assumption, and to attempt to observe with an open mind was in contrast with the ear earlier Aristotelian approach uh, of deduction by which analysis of known facts produced further understanding. In practice, many scientists and philosophers believed that a healthy mix of both was needed, um, of the willingness to question assumptions, yet also to interpret observations assumed to have some degree of validity. So it's not that the scientific method just throws out deduction. It's that the scientific method is utilizing induction more, or it's just saying, hey, we need a healthy mix of both of these. Francis Bacon is seen as the, the father of the modern scientific method. I'm going to give you a lot of names in this PowerPoint um, of people you, you want to know. A lot of them are going to be familiar to you, but definitely you should be looking at categorizing them and remembering them for the, uh, the AP exam and for AP Euro. So um, speaking of names, so the scientists that we need to know, I already mentioned Nicholas Copernicus. Um, he challenges the idea that the the universe is geocentric. He argues that it is heliocentric, meaning the Earth and all the planets revolve around the sun. Copernicus is basing this on um, observations. He doesn't really have a lot of proof. And actually, he waits to publish his theory um, until he dies. He knew what his theory would mean. And one of the first editions of his his work on the revolution of the heavenly spheres he actually starts out that edition with an apology to the Pope. Um, he writes an introduction to the book that is apologizing to the Pope. He says, look, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Christian. I believe in the teachings of the church, but I also believe that based on my observations and my theories, this teaching of the church is wrong, and I have to put it out there 
um, be, because that's what I think is, is the right thing to do. But he's so afraid of doing that that he doesn't do it um, until he, he dies. Galileo comes along right after Copernicus dies. And Galileo's contribution is that um, he really proves Copernicus right um, through uh, um, much more in-depth observations than Copernicus was able to do because Galileo is spending a lot of time improving um, optics, improving telescope technology. So he observes Jupiter moons, which Jupiter's moons, which we refer to as the Galilean moons. He looks at sunspots, the rings of Saturn. I mean, he's discovering a lot about our solar system. He's publishing all of this in works and he is, he is helping to create this mountain of evidence to support Copernicus. But as we would guess, the church, which remember the context here is embattled against the Protestant religions. The church makes him recant his discoveries to come in front of church officials and recant his um, discoveries. We have to remember that context of the reformation that's going on around all of these scientists who are living to the church is really under fire. They are, they are under fire for, you know, think about Luther's 95 Theses and how he is criticizing the church or John Calvin or Zwingli and how they are, they are criticizing the church. Now the church is also being criticized by scientists and by the scientific community. And so they are pushing back hard against um, these claims. Remember, guys, the significance here is from the church's perspective is that if the church admits it has been wrong about like central teachings of the scientific and natural world, it just further erodes people's trust in their ability to to view the church as godly. You know, if if priests are speaking for God, how are they wrong about so many things? That's an impossible question for the church to answer. So anyway, um, so Kepler, mathematical theory, proving Copernicus's work. So again, layering on the understanding that Copernicus was correct. Galileo is doing it for observate through observation. Kepler is doing it through observation, but also through the use of mathematics um, and shows how the universe can be studied, explained, and understood. And yeah, that's the key, that last bullet point there. The universe is not a mystery known only to God. This was the classic example, or sorry, the classic response that the church would give when they were when they were challenged. Um why don't we know X? Why don't we know Y? Why don't we know Z? And the church would just say, well, that's a challenge known only to God, or excuse me, that's a mystery known only to God. These scientists during the scientific revolution are really challenging that notion. And they're saying, well, that's not an acceptable answer anymore. If we are great as human beings, think about humanism and the Renaissance, if, our, if God has given us greatness and has given us these skills, shouldn't God also want us to understand the natural world, to understand the world around us? And don't we as humans have the duty to try to do that? Um, that's a challenge that the church really didn't have an answer to and wasn't wasn't prepared for. Asked of the great scientist Isaac Newton, um, I, I should have mentioned, so um, Copernicus is Polish, Galileo is Italian, and Kepler is German. So we're really ranging all across Central Europe um, and Western Europe here, and then Isaac Newton is um, is British. So this revolution really is spreading across Western, Central, um, and to to an extent Eastern Europe as well. Isaac Newton, very famous theory of gravity, um, mecha uh, mechanistic view of the world opposed to the medieval world view, and yeah, going back to that point about Kepler, um, the world and the universe works like a machine. And if it works like a machine, just like we as humans can study machines and understand them, we as humans can study the machine of the natural world. Um, so that's Isaac Newton. You know, the impact here should be pretty obvious. Um, the institutionalization of science is a big part of this. The first scientific institutions, institutions that are founded for the study and spread of scientific discoveries and knowledge are mid 17th century, the Royal Society of London is the first of, of these in the European world. The French Academy of Sciences founded in 1666. Both of these are still around today. So this idea that science is something that should be institutionalized. It's not just like random people who are working out of their houses, although that's a big part of it. But it's also that we need to teach this stuff. We need to bring scientists together. We need to, to put them under the umbrella of universities, and colleges, but also just royal societies that are funded by the king and queen, uh, the, the rulers of, of these European countries, so that science can be 
better understood and can be disseminated. The scientific method, obviously, which was talked about the development of new fields of study, chemistry which had been around, but it's going to start to, to shift from like alchemy to modern chemistry and our understanding of modern chemistry. Physics, you know, I mentioned Isaac Newton basically creates um, mechanical physics as a field in the late 17th century. So um, really, really big developments there. Tons of important inventions can be related back to this time period and are happening during this time period. Early cal calculating devices, um, telescopes are improving dramatically. The vacuum tube, which is going to be really, really important um, when we get to the 19th and the, uh, 20th centuries. And the connection to the, the other thing that we're going to talk about next, which is the Enlightenment. It, it should be clear to you how these two things connect and are directly related. They're happening concurrently in some ways, which you'll see the scientific revolution is like 1500s to 1600s and the Enlightenment is 1600s to 1700s. So they are related and they're happening concurrently, but I usually view it as like scientific revolution is first, Enlightenment is second. That's a little bit of a misnomer, but it's, it's pretty close. So the Enlightenment, um, European philosophers are influenced by the scientific revolution, the Renaissance, humanism, the Reformation, all those things. And they're kind of looking at society in the same way as the scientists are looking at the natural world. So we can utilize science to understand how the natural world works like a machine. The philosophers, the philosophers of the Enlightenment are saying, hey, we can do the same thing to society. We can do the same thing with politics. We can study it. We can understand it. Um, and then we can better apply it. So think about political science, for example, the scientific approach to politics. This is the Enlightenment. You guys can see how this is directly related to um, the scientific revolution, of course. So the goal here is to improve conditions for the people. Their goal, broadly speaking, is to improve the workings of society, to make society better, more efficient, more equitable, all those things. A, a, um, a disclaimer here is we have to, to talk about who we mean by the people. The philosophers are going to talk in universal terms. Um, the philosophers are going to talk about freedom for all and rights for all. What they meant by all is very different than what we mean by all. And I think most of you recognize that, but I, I do want to point that out. The philosophers, when they say all, they're talking about all men. They're talking about all white men. They're talking about all white landowning men. You know, it differed philosopher to philosopher, but most of them are talking about a pretty privileged, privileged strata of European society. They are not talking about Africans. They are not talking about foreigners. Um, they are not talking about women for the most part. They're leaving out huge pieces of society. But an important thing that the philosophers are doing is by using that universalizing language, by talking about all, they allow for those groups, those marginalized groups, to point to the writings of the philosophers and say, well, wait a second, it doesn't say all white men, it says all. And so we, the disenfranchised and the marginalized, should also have a say in our society, in our government, we should have equality. So. We need to remember that these philosophers are existing at a time um, that is very different than our own. So, um, like I said, I think you're, you're aware of that, but just pointing it out. Censors around Paris, the salons of Paris, these meeting places to have discussions. Uh, you know, another example of what I was just talking about there, how the, the Enlightenment really chips away at this, this patriarchal society, which, you know, still exists today for sure, but it's beginning to chip away at it. The philosophers themselves almost all of them are men. However, the salons are places where women are also gathering. The women are serving as hostesses. The women are the ones in these salons who are, are serving as uh, the, the hosts for the party, as it were. They're also setting the topics. They're the ones who are setting the topics for debate and for discourse. And they are present when these topics are being discussed. And so women, in a small way, are being invited into the public sphere. We'll talk about that notion of the public sphere in a moment. It, it, it does not mean that women are equal. It does not mean that women are even being asked to discuss these things or are being trusted to discuss these things. But it's the beginning of that process. And that's another huge part of the Enlightenment. 
So some of the philosophes, um, Thomas Hobbes is seen as, in some ways, one of the, the first, if not the first of the Enlightenment philosophers. His major work is Leviathan, which is published in 1651. Hobbes is um, English, but during the English Civil War, he flees to France. And um, during the, uh, the latter stages of the English Civil War and into Cromwell's reign, Hobbes is writing about the benefits of absolute monarchy. He's actually a defender of absolute monarchy, which is why he has to flee England when Hobbes takes control, excuse me, when um, Cromwell takes control. So he believes in the absolute power of the monarchy. However, the way that he is going to justify it is very different than how a lot of other absolute monarchs are going to justify it. If you think back to last unit, absolute monarchs are going to say, well, we rule because of God right? You know, divine right. We rule because we're the most powerful, because our family has ruled for hundreds of years. Hobbes is going to take a different approach. And what he is going to say is that absolute monarchs, kings and queens, emperors, whatever they are, they rule from the consent of the people. They rule because the people recognize that they are naturally brutish and warlike and nasty. And without that absolute ruler, without that person to keep the people's um, natural, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, natural urges or inclinations in check, then the people will, society will fall apart, basically. And so by, by stating this, Hobbes is carving out a place where we can look at the rights of the individual and that all men are, in fact, created equal. Now, what Hobbes is saying is, well, yes, that's true. However, because human nature is so negative, because human nature is so, it has these anarchist tendencies, you need that absolute ruler, all right? So people consent to have that absolute ruler. However, they don't have the right to revolt. John Locke is going to come along a little bit after Thomas Hobbes. Locke is also English. And in his second treatise of government, he is going to argue, well, look, Hobbes is correct that people are consenting to be governed. However, sovereignty resides with the people. The sovereignty of the state does not reside with the absolute monarch. It resides with the people. When the people consent to be governed, that means that they are the ultimate arbiters of their, their fate. So they are the ones who, uh, oops, sorry, who consent to be governed. And the key here then is that ha um, Locke, argues that the people can withdraw their consent. Hobbes says you consent to be governed, but it is what it is. Sometimes you get good rulers and sometimes you get bad. The people just have to deal with it. Locke says, no, 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 that is not how this works. If the sovereignty resides with the people and the people consent to be governed, if the ruler breaks that contract, then it is acceptable for the people to revolt when the government steps on those individual rights. Locke is a very significant figure in a lot of the revolutions that are gonna take place in the late 18th century. As is this man, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who, uh, as the name suggests, is French, and Rousseau publishes his famous work is The Social Contract. It talks a lot about the general will of the people and just the idea of the social contact, contract, excuse me, the protection under the laws are collectively created. They are collect, um, collectively created, meaning created by the, the body public, the people writ large. He's going to pair nicely with John Locke here and Locke's idea that the people are sovereign, right? He also believes that sovereignty lies with the people. Rousseau is, is going to be a strong advocate for democracy. Now, democracy with restrictions, democracy with rules, but the idea of majority rules. He, however, does not believe in representative government. You notice how each of these people, each of these philosophers are kind of building on the last and taking what the last said and going one step further. Um, and that really, those three, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, I want you to view that way as sort of one, two, and three. The rest of them are just going to be intertwined here. Uh, Montesquieu, um, big on separation of powers, the three branches of government in the United States is a great example of what Montesquieu is talking about. If we separate powers, it's going to make despotism, um, it's going to make um, uh, despots less likely to be able to rule and to take power. 
We can still centralize power, but if we separate it out into different branches, each branch is going to be able to check the other's power, right? So this is the system of, of checks and balances. So um, Montesquieu, he himself is also French. He's writing about the divisions in French society, the monarchy, the aristocracy, and the commons. When we get to the French Revolution, we'll talk about the three estates and how the three estates three estates exist here. They're a little different than Montesquieu. You know, the, the monarchy and the aristocracy are lumped into one, the church is another, and then everybody else is lumped into another. And so the separation of power in French government as well is something that Montesquieu is, is arguing for. Voltaire, also French, um, very famous. His, his most famous work is Candide, although Voltaire, out of all of these guys, was the most prolific writer of them all. Voltaire writes something like 20,000 letters um, in his lifetime, which you, if you break that out um, by day is remarkable. He's just writing all day, every day. He writes something like 2,000 books and pamphlets on top of that. Um, he was an incredibly prolific writer, as I, as I say there. Most famous for criticizing Christianity. Um, he's famous for advocating civil liberties. But when you think about Voltaire, I want you to think about a strong critic of Christianity. Now, not, I'm not just talking about like he wants separation of church. He was arguing against Christianity. Um, so, so pretty, pretty radical um, in some ways there. Um, Diderot, Denis Diderot, also French, um, existed, you know, he lived in the, the mid 18th century which, with a lot of these other guys. Co-founder and chief editor of the encyclopedia. There's a French way to say that. I'm not going to embarrass myself by saying it. This is the first encyclopedia to have contributions from multiple writers. And the goal here is to catalog all knowledge. I mean, that is the goal of the encyclopedia. The encyclopedia is a, a multi-decade process. The goal is to just keep creating volumes. As knowledge is written down, the encyclopedia and the writers and editors of the encyclopedia, their goal is to catalog all of that knowledge. Incredibly ambitious. You know, and, and, I mean, Diderot's goal is to catalog all knowledge in the known world. You know, kind of like the, the original internet, I guess, in some ways. So the impact of the Enlightenment, it's just huge. I mean, it's it touches all areas of European life, political, social, economic, cultural. It's, it's everywhere. It really is everywhere. Um, the intellectual foundations for individual rights, freedoms, liberties, the, the arguments for democracy. A lot of these philosophes are not necessarily supporters of democracy, but their line of thinking leads society to that end, to that conclusion. Look, if you believe that the protection of individual rights and freedoms are what's best, and you believe that sovereignty resides with the people, you're going to end up at democracy um, as, as, a, as a terminus in some ways. You could go past democracy, um, which, you know, like Karl Marx is going to do in the 19th century, but that's where a lot of, uh, that's certainly where our society has ended up so far is democracy, separation of church and state, capitalism, you know, capitalism, free market, free enterprise, you know, the right of an individual to, to uh, pursue their own economic interests. This fits right in with the enlightenment um, and with the, with the thinkers. Yeah, I made this point before, but you know, the key thing here is the enlightenment is used to justify the quest of these things. Um, Revolutions, Haitian Revolution, French Revolution, American Revolution, Latin American Revolution, pretty much every revolution that you look at after the late 18th century, it's going to use Enlightenment thinking to justify the cause in some way. Russian Revolution, it's, it's all there. Some of those revolutions are going to be more radical. Some of those revolutions are going to go beyond the Enlightenment, like the Russian Revolution, for example. But the Enlightenment, it's just the underpinnings of all of that. And, um, you know, the creation of the public sphere, too. The argumentation should be open um, to reason, uh, open to all, very egalitarian, you know. Um, we all have things to bring to the table, to the intellectual discussion. And, um, yeah, links to industrialization, of course, too. That's, you know, that's, that's capitalism right there. So, uh, yeah, two slides left here. So the enlightened absolutism, which seems like a contradiction in terms, um, but, it, and it is, it is somewhat. The ab enlightened absolute monarchs who are going to rule um, in the, the mid to late 18th century are going to use the enlightenment to their advantage. They're going to espouse enlightenment views. They're going to say, hey, I'm, I am protecting your individual rights and freedoms. I am protecting your right to be whatever religion you want, as long as it's Christian. Um, I am I am protecting these things. 
And so they are, they are going to argue that they are ruling for the good of the people and by the will of the people. This is, this is a, a merging of what Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau are really talking about here. And so they're replacing their justification to rule as divine right with the social contract. You, the people, are the ones who want me to rule. And so they are protecting some rights. Um, they are not protecting others, but they are protecting some rights. You can view the enlightened absolute monarchs as a part of a natural evolution from absolute monarchs to enlightened absolute monarchs to rule by the people. I mean, that's like the three-stage process here. They're like the intermediaries. Great quote, everything for the people, nothing by the people. And you can see how that is the evolution. Absolute monarchs are nothing for the people, nothing by the people. Enlightened monarchs, everything for the people, nothing by the people. Um, and those revolutions, French Revolution is going to be everything for the people, everything by the people. That's our, those are our three stages there um, of development. So examples, Frederick the Great is usually the one that is pointed to. He is communicating with a lot of the, um, the philosophes at the time, most famously Voltaire. Um, so Frederick the Great of Prussia, Catherine the Great also is communicating with some of these people. She's writing with Diderot. I think Diderot comes to Russia and lives in the Russian court for a time. Don't quote me on that, but I think that is the case. Joseph II of Austria, Gustav III of Sweden. These are all examples of enlightened absolute rulers. And I want you to look at, notice when they all ruled too, right? They are all ruling up to that time, right when these revolutions are beginning to start. And so what we see is this, this gradual overtaking of absolutism as something that is justifiable through enlightenment means by, air quotes around it, the people. Um, so uh, most of these rulers die of natural causes. I think Gustav III is assassinated. I'm not, I don't remember about um, Joseph II, um, but it, it just so happens that that's, you know, that's the end of it. All right, um, so life in the 18th century, uh, I think the period's about to end. I'm doing this on my preps. So you're gonna get a couple announcements here. So just uh, just feel free to ignore those. So um, just a little bit of a snapshot here. So marriage in Europe is later than most of the world. And the other big thing that's happening in the 18th century is the emphasis on the nuclear family versus the extended family. This is becoming the norm where people, young people are getting married and they are leaving the home. Most of the rest of the world, the extended family is the norm. You have like three generations who are living together. Europe is challenging that and the nuclear family is becoming the norm. This is of course our norm in, um, in our society today. Uh, the impact of industrialization, we'll talk more about this next unit. Please proceed to your next but more freedom for young people. Young people, it's harder to supervise as young people are leaving the homes to get, to get work. It's harder to supervise young people. And so this leads to young people delaying marriage, um, having uh, multiple suitors to, um, you know, the, the um, uh, what was the word I was looking for? Oh, more illegitimate births. Um, all these sorts of things are, are going to be happening. And also sexuality, you know, um, the emergence of same-sex cultures is something that is classes, that is um, definitely accelerating during the 18th century. Same-sex subcultures have existed forever. I mean, they've been a part of pretty much every society, every society. Um, they're becoming larger. They're becoming a little bit more accepted in the 18th century. I don't want to overemphasize that because for the most part, um, those people who are taking same-sex same partners are condemned by society as being ungodly. However, it's tolerated by rulers. Um, I think your textbook points out um, James, I think it's James the first or James the second. I can't remember which one um, in England has multiple same-sex partners. And this is tolerated as long as the ruler is producing an heir. And so we, what we see is the, the seeds of same-sex partners, um, not same-sex marriage, but same-sex partners being a part of society. I don't even want to go to go down the road of acceptance, but the seeds are there, right? The seeds are there. Literacy and education is also increasing, um, again, headed towards the idea of public education, but we're not there yet. That's going to be a 19th century thing. 
So life in the 18th century, it's beginning to change. We're going to take a, a closer look at this next unit when we look at industrialization, which is also linked to this. You know, I mentioned the impact of industrialization, but there's much more to talk about there. Um, so that's a little bit of a snapshot of life in the, uh, the 18th century. Big takeaways for this unit are definitely scientific revolution and enlightenment, however. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I got. Any questions? We can, uh, we can tackle them in class.